Hi everyone. So this week you're going to be working on two different labs. You're going to be starting out with your periodic table and the ionic bonding lab. And then you also have one on covalent bonds and organic chemistry. So two labs to be working on this week. Again, your analysis isn't due until the following week. So you have a little bit of time to get all of that paperwork done and submit it to Blackboard. But I'm going to start talking you through the periodic table and ionic bonding lab for this video. So as you know, you can go on to Socrates to pull up the lab. It'll have the entire procedure that'll walk you through step by step what to do. You should fill out any questions there as you go, and then you'll have your analysis at the very end, which is what I look for as a grade. So for this periodic table and ionic bonding lab, you are going to need a few pieces of paper from your lab kit. Your first one is going to be your cutouts of the subatomic particles. And you should also have an image of a lovely Bohr model here. Okay. So get both of those out in front of you as you do this lab. You might also want to have your periodic table in front of you as well. This will be pretty helpful unless you have part of it memorized. Okay, so I'm just going to go through this procedure with you, kind of tell you what you might want to expect as you do this lab. So first and foremost, you're going to read through everything and make sure you understand it in its entirety and that you have enough time to dedicate to the lab before you get started. But let's go ahead and jump into part A. So part A is looking at patterns in the periodic table. Now we've had lectures on this and you've already read sections in your book about this. So this is just to help reinforce and give those of you who are more hands-on learners a bit of extra practice. But it shouldn't be new stuff and hopefully you can walk through and look back at your notes from our lectures and understand what's being asked. If you do have questions, always, always feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, come to recitation, let me know what you're struggling with. So part A, we start out talking about protons. Protons are the defining part of an atom. However many protons there are determines what the element is, what type of atom it is, okay? Number of protons. So for question one, it's gonna tell you how many protons are in a certain atom, and you'll have to use your periodic table to simply write down the chemical symbol. So just that letter that represents whatever has one proton, whichever has two protons. And then you go to question two. Question two also wants you to look at the periodic table to answer a few questions. In terms of how the periodic table is arranged, what pattern do you notice? Think about protons specifically for that question. What pattern do you notice for the protons? How many protons does uranium have? So you're going to have to go through your periodic table and find uranium, and you should be able to tell how many protons there are. And your next question, are there any uranium atoms that don't have this number of protons? Well, think about that for a minute and type in your response. Let me know what you think. Question number three, is then going to talk about the charges of the elements. So again, things we've lectured on, we've talked about as a class, but this is just to give you a little bit more practice. So atoms are electrically neutral. They do not have a charge. Therefore, their charge has to be equal to zero. So this question is pretty nice review. It asks the charge of protons, the charge of neutrons, and the charge of electrons. And remember, when I ask you a charge of something, you should be giving me a number for it as well, especially if I ask you the charge of ions. In regards to the number of subatomic particles, what has to happen in order for an atom to be electrically neutral? So think about the math of it. Think about how elements are set up. What has to happen with the subatomic particles for there to be no charge at all? You can put that down in your own words on your homework assignment. All right, so to continue with your review, you're gonna be looking at question number four, which is just another table to fill out. It says, determine the number of protons and electrons for the following elements in all atomic form. So as an atom, tell me how many protons there are and how many electrons, and you should use your periodic table for that. Number five asks what two subatomic particles determine charge, and number six asks which two subatomic particles determine mass. So just as a heads up, these are some really good test questions. These are things that you should understand how to do pretty simply for any kind of exam. And then we move on a little bit. 
It says, while every atom of carbon has exactly six protons, they do not have the same number of neutrons. So here we're talking about isotopes. Make sure you know that definition. Now this is specifically talking about isotopes of carbon. So there are three naturally occurring isotopes, all with different amounts of neutrons, but the same number of protons. These isotopes occur in different amounts in nature, meaning most often I'll find one type, but every now and then I'll find some other amounts of neutrons. The most common isotope, as we've talked about in lecture, the most common isotope is of course the one with the closest mass from the periodic table. And that's how we name them, which you'll see as you go to your images on the page that show the nucleus of these different isotopes of carbon. So carbon-12 is the most common isotope of carbon because when we look at our periodic table, we can see that the atomic mass is 12.011, which is very close to 12. You can see carbon-13 and carbon-14, which respectively have one more neutron added to each. So make sure you read through all of the text here because this is really great review and really great extra practice for exams. And then for number seven, you have another table to complete. So you're going to be looking at the number of neutrons for the most common isotope. It'll give you the chemical symbol. You'll have to put how many protons there are, and you'll have to put the average atomic mass, which you get straight off of the periodic table, no problem. You then will round the average atomic mass to the nearest whole number, and then you're going to list the most common isotope, or MCI. Okay. Then you can do a little bit of quick math to tell how many neutrons are in the most common isotope. And if you forget how to do that, take a look at our lecture videos again. But it's just simple solving that math equation, where mass is equal to the protons plus the neutrons. Now number eight wants you to start using some of the worksheets. So using your subatomic particle worksheet, cut out the protons, neutrons, and electrons. So get some scissors, it'll take a few minutes to cut out all your circles. And then you're going to choose an A group of elements. So remember our A groups are those tall columns, columns 1A, 2A, and then jump over to 3A all the way to 8A. So choose one of the A columns, not the transition metals and make the most common isotope for any element in that group of your choosing. Use your subatomic particles to actually put together the nucleus and the electrons and see what it looks like. Only use an element from rows two or three, just so you don't get too complicated. You might not have enough subatomic particles in your sheet. Once you do that, you can maybe do it on a table and then take a picture of it with your phone and just insert that straight into your document. So if you're editing this as a Word document, you can just go to insert, insert photo. You have, might have to email it to yourself or save it to your computer, but you can sure enough put it in here. If you cannot put it in the Word document, give IT a call and they'll be very nice in walking you through exactly how to do it. And please do make sure to actually use the cutouts a lot of you said that you have more of that kinesthetic learning type where you really like to actually do things hands-on. And even though this seems pretty simplistic, it does help to reinforce some of these different concepts we're talking about. So that's the end of part A. We'll now talk a little bit about part B. So part B is going to talk a bit more about geometry to help understand these different chemical elements on the periodic table. So it says, now that you've mastered the number of subatomic particles in each element, it's time to focus on the subatomic particle that it determines how the atom behaves, the electron, right? The electron is what reacts chemically. So have your periodic table nearby, and you're going to go and look at this table, table number one. Here is the ionization energy. So again, we talked about this definition in our lectures. It's also in your book, so take a real look at it again if you need a refresher. But the ionization energy is the amount of energy needed to take away an electron from an atom. And remember, our nonmetals are happy, or sorry, our metals are happy to give away those electrons, so that ionization energy will be low for metals. Where nonmetals, it will be quite high because they really want to pull electrons to their nucleus. 
So keep that in mind as you look at these different ionization energies listed on the table one. And it will be quite an extensive table, but when you keep scrolling down, you'll get to some questions about it. So the periodic table does look a bit confusing at first, but as we go, we see a lot of patterns that emerge from it, patterns that can help you answer all sorts of questions about the chemistry and about the atoms individually. So we're going to look for patterns in the electrons, especially those outermost electrons or the valence shell. Remember, our valence shell we care about because they are the outermost, they are the ones that are interacting with neighboring atoms, or really making chemistry happen. So we're going to try to do a little bit of picture making here for our visual learners, our kinesthetic learners, just to try to get a bit more practice. So question number one, or step one, I should say. This table above shows how much force or energy is required to remove an atom from the outermost shell. When an atom gains or loses an electron, it creates an ion. And remember, if it has a positive charge, we call it a cation. If it has a negative charge, we call it an anion. And that process is called ionization. The process of forming an ion is called ionization. That might be a term that you should write down to know. And of course, it says metals generally lose electrons while nonmetals gain electrons. So think about that relationship between the ionization energy and the electronegativity that we talked about in lecture. We'll look for patterns that emerge from this data. One of the best ways to see patterns is with a graph. So you might want to print the graph paper off if you have a printer at home and draw on it. Or maybe you can draw on your laptop with some kind of stylus or with your finger or even with your mouse. Or maybe you draw it on some scratch paper and you take a picture on your phone to upload to your homework. So however you need to make a graph, do it as best as you can and just make sure to upload it to this by going into insert on your document. Now step two, you're gonna make a graph of the first ionization energies, just the first column there, not the second. That shows how the ionization energy varies as the atomic number increases. So as your protons increase, what happens to your ionization energy? Now your second ionization energy is pulling off a second electron. So for this, we're just looking at the first ionization energy. Now on your graph, you want to label your x-axis the atomic number. Remember, your x-axis is going to be that horizontal plane at the bottom and you're going to want to number it 1 to 36, okay? 1 to 36, and that label is going to be atomic number. Your y-axis or your vertical axis is then going to be your ionization energy in joules, and you're going to label it from 0 to 130. Now, you might not have 130 lines on the paper you're using, so you're certainly welcome to set your graph up in different sections. Maybe you go by tens, maybe you go from 0 to 10, 20, 30, and you label it that way. So find what fits best for the graph sheet that you're using, and make sure that you label the entire way across as best you can with your y-axis and your x-axis according to number two on your procedure. Okay, down to number three. It says write the first ionization energy of 8.6 times 10 to the negative 19 in a standard decimal form. So all you're doing is taking that scientific notation number, 8.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and you are writing it out as a decimal. Of course, that's a negative exponent, which means your number is going to be very small. You're going to have a lot of zeros after that decimal place. So make sure you count them out. You're moving the decimal to the left 19 times. Now number four, I kind of gave that to you, right? Is this a big or a small value? Well, it's a negative exponent. You'll have a lot of zeros, so it should be a very small value. And tell me, is it positive or negative? Going to number five, you are then going to want to plot the data and make your graph on your graph paper. So using that table, plot the ionization energy for the first ionization energy, all of those numbers you see in the columns, matching up with their atomic number or their proton number. And you should just be putting dots at each point 
And then you can come back and connect them by lines if you would like. But do dots first and then come back and connect your dots as lines if you'd like. And then using that graph you've made, you can come back and answer these questions. So pause the video and go ahead and make your graph. And then once you come back, we'll look at number five. So for number five, it says what column has the peaks with high ionization energies? So what columns on your periodic table, meaning column 1A, 2A, 3A, all the way over, which of those columns has the highest ionization energies? Is there one column that has a higher ionization energy than any other? Write that down. And then it asks the opposite. What column has the low points after the peaks? So of all of those seven or eight, sorry, all of those eight columns, which one has the lowest ionization energy for that column? And so as you'll see, when you look at your graph and you match it up with the periodic table, your columns and your rows are going to help you see different values on the periodic table and different patterns. And looking to number six, it says draw four bold lines down your graph that group the elements into their four periods or rows. So what you want to do here is you want to draw vertical lines on your graph that are going to group all of these into their individual rows. So for example, row one has hydrogen and helium, which are atomic numbers one and two. So on your graph, your x-axis should have atomic numbers one and two. When you get to number two, draw a big line, a big vertical line at number two, just straight down your graph. And then you're going to go to your next row. Your next row, row number two, starts with lithium, which is atomic number three and it goes all the way to atomic number 10, which is neon. So on your x-axis, find number three and number 10, and when you get to number 10, draw a big vertical line. And then you're gonna go down to argon, which is number 18, draw a big vertical line at number 18, and so forth. Okay, so take a minute to do that. And then look at what patterns have emerged. So now that you've drawn everything, with those vertical lines grouping the rows of the periodic table, what do you notice? What's happening between those vertical lines or within that row of the periodic table? Write down what you found out. And then we'll go to number seven. Number seven says when a relatively large amount of energy is required to remove an electron, remember it has a high ionization energy, that atom is considered to be fairly stable with its electrons. Okay. So think about the elements that are the most stable that you know from lecture, and then think about how that looks on your graph. Now you're going to fill out your table here. The element with the most stable arrangement or the highest first ionization energy for row number one. What element is that? For row number two, out of the entire row, which element has the highest ionization energy or the most stable arrangement? And so on and so forth. And we're only going up to atomic number 36. Now number eight says, which elements are not stable with a low ionization energy after the peaks? So write down a few of those elements. And number nine, which column do these elements fit into? And how many valence electrons do atoms in this column have? So again, just looking at trends, finding for yourself those things that I've lectured to you about, and helping to review. Now on to number 11. It says, generally speaking, describe what the second ionization energy is like for elements in column one. So go out to your table, look at what the second ionization energy looks like, and explain why you think it is that way. So I'm not gonna give you the answer. Go back to your table, compare it to your first ionization energy, think about how it would look as a graph, and write down your findings. And of course, that second ionization energy is the second electron being removed. Now to number 12. It says, look at the second ionization energy for beryllium, magnesium, and calcium and compare them to the second ionization energy for the element right before, the element in the first column. Okay. How do they compare? What do you notice about the second ionization energy differences? 
And which column do these elements fit into? So beryllium, magnesium, calcium, what column do they fit into? And number 14, how many valence electrons do they have? Again, calcium, magnesium, beryllium. How many valence electrons do they have? And number 15, generally speaking, state a rule. So make up some kind of rule about the elements in the second column that relates their number of electrons in their outermost valence shell and how they form an ion. So this is what we've talked about in lecture quite a lot. Column two has how many valence electrons and because of that valence electron number, how will it create an ion? Let me know what you think. And then for number 16, this is where you put a picture of your graph. So whether you drew it by hand and insert it as a photo or whether you draw it on your graph paper, you scan it on a computer, however you need to do it. And then if you keep scrolling down, you'll see that there is graph paper there for you. You can orient it however you'd like. So you can turn it sideways if that's easier. I would keep it vertical for this because your x-axis only has numbers 1 through 36, whereas your y-axis is going up to 130. And that's the end of part B. All right. We'll go on to part C. Part C is talking about ionic bonds. So ionic bonds, again, are things we've talked about in lecture. Maybe take a look back at those lecture videos, the recordings, if you're struggling with these concepts. But hopefully this lab will help you reinforce some of those ionic bond discussions that we've had. So part C. When a metal bonds with a nonmetal, the ionic bond is formed. It's called ionic because those atoms make ions when they interact, right? They either lose electrons or they gain electrons and they result in some kind of charge. Thus, ionization has happened. Metals lose electrons, which makes them positive ions or cations. Nonmetals gain electrons, which makes them negative or anions, okay? So make sure those are in your notes somewhere and you know that. But what's the size of the charge of the ion? It's not enough to simply say it's positive or negative. I need to know how positive or how negative. Is it plus one? Is it plus three? Is it minus two or is it minus three? I need to know the number associated with it as well. How many of each atom is necessary to form bonds? Well, we've talked about that in a couple of different ways, but we're gonna use some cutouts to help us see how this works. So question number one. The valence electrons play the critical role in the atom's chemical behavior. And we're going to look at sodium in column one. So the left-hand side of our periodic table tends to have our metals. So sodium is a metal. It conducts electricity. It holds the outermost electrons loosely, meaning it's very happy to give them away. It has a low ionization energy. When sodium loses an electron, it becomes a positive ion or a cation. And then it has that same configuration in its outermost valence shell as neon. So when it loses that extra electron, it's then down to the next layer, the lower layer, that is a filled up valence shell. So it's happy. So answer the questions in number one. How many protons does sodium have? How many negative electrons does sodium have? Just as an atom. And then think about it as an ion. So the question here says, how many electrons does a sodium ion have? So think about it as an atom first, and then think about it in terms of an ion, and write down the ionic electron configuration. And what is the charge of a sodium ion? So what is the charge? Is it positive? Is it negative? And what's the number associated with it? And what column is sodium in? Then we're going to look at chlorine. So this is an example we've done quite a bit in class together. Chlorine is our nonmetal on the right of the periodic table, and it really likes to attract electrons. It has a high ionization energy and a high electronegativity. So when chlorine gains an electron, it then has the same electron configuration as argon, a noble gas, or a full valence shell, which means it's happy, it's stable. So answer the questions for number two. How many protons? How many electrons are in a sodium ion? I would change that. There, that should say chlorine. So if you see that typo on your page as well, 
For number two, this is all supposed to ask about chlorine. So how many protons does chlorine have? How many electrons does a chlorine ion have? What is the charge of the chlorine ion? And what column is chlorine in? Okay, now it says review the charges on the sodium ion and the chloride. So when we call it chloride, we know that it's now the ionic form. Notice how they balance each other. Ionic compounds will form in a way so that their overall charge is zero. When they come together and they make a molecule, their charge will be zero. But each individual ion will have different charges. Okay, And so this is where we come in and we try to figure out the chemical formula for ionic bonds. This is something that we've done a lot in recitation and that we've talked about in our lecture recordings. So you're really looking for the ratio. How many sodium ions does it take to bond with how many chlorine ions? And for this, it's nice and easy to see, well, you just need one of each. That's the ratio. But for some, like if you remember our aluminum oxide example from lecture, you might need a whole lot of one to make up a nice equal arrangement based on how many valence electrons they have. So take a look at the chlorine and example there. Of course, that's table salt, sodium chloride. And then jump down to number three. So here we're gonna look into the Lewis dot structures or the electron dots. And this is where you put just the valence electron dots around. Again, something we've talked about in lecture to review if you're struggling with this. So we wanna look at how sodium chloride, the compound, is formed. Refer to the Lewis dot structure. It shows how the valence electrons will be arranged. And then you want to write a little bit of a note about it, what you've noticed. Okay. And jump to number four. We're just going to do another example, a different compound. So magnesium is in column two. How many valence electrons does it have? For magnesium to have a stable electron configuration, a full valence shell, it has to lose two electrons. Now it's a metal, it's easier to lose those two electrons than to gain six. So it's gonna lose two electrons and it's gonna end up with an ionic charge. Write down what that charge would be. Now you need to think about how many chlorine atoms would be necessary to accept those two electrons from magnesium. So this is where you might need to think about it for a second, do a little bit of the math to find your ratio. You can either draw this out as your electron dot diagrams, move those electrons with the arrows like I did in class, or maybe you like the crisscross switcheroo method where you write down the ionic charges and simply drop that number to the opposite area, to the opposite element. So however you do it, think about how many chlorine atoms will be necessary to accept those electrons from magnesium. You're essentially trying to think of the chemical formula. And then down below, you can draw the Lewis dot structure or upload it if you take a picture on some separate scrap paper and make sure that you have your arrow showing where all of these electrons are gonna go. So this is just a really nice way to draw it out to help you visualize how to find the chemical formula for these ionic bonds. And then number five, you're gonna write the chemical formula that you found. And a little note for you to read. Remember, we don't have to write the ones. And those little numbers for the atoms that tell us how many are going to be written as subscripts, so little tiny numbers. So make sure you read through that as you scroll down to number six. All right, number six. It says ionic bonds are formed when metal bonds with a nonmetal. So metals and nonmetals typically make ionic bonds. The nonmetal will typically accept the electrons, the metal will give them away. So predict the formula for aluminum bromide. Use whatever method you'd like, Lewis dot structure, crisscross method, work it out on some scratch paper, and then write down on number six the chemical formula for aluminum bromide. Number seven, where are the metals found on the periodic table? Are they on the left? Are they on the right? Are they in the middle? Or do you think? And number eight, where are the nonmetals found? Nice and easy. All right, number nine. Atoms in column 1a, 2a, or 3a will give away their valence electrons, and it's going to make that innermost electron shell nice and complete so they're stable. Okay, 
Conversely, the right-hand side, columns, well, really 4a over to 7a, are going to gain electrons. They're going to try to grab other electrons to complete their outermost shell. Everyone wants to reach the octet rule, which is eight electrons, except for hydrogen and helium, which are happy at two. Okay. And remember how we've talked about in class, the valence electrons kind of follow their own rule. Or sorry, the transition metals kind of follow their own rule for valence electrons. So the transition metals, those guys in the middle lake region, not these big columns, but the middle, those are your transition metals. And in order to know how many valence electrons they have, you'll be given some type of information in the problem because their valence electrons can change. Okay. So it says that the transition metals will have a Roman numeral after their symbol, which will tell you how many valence electrons it has. And again, we've seen that in lecture. The numerals can be different in different problems because they can change. So maybe in one situation, iron has two valence electrons, but in the next, it has three valence electrons. All right. So here you're going to predict formulas for a few different compounds, calcium oxide, aluminum sulfide, and iron iodide. And in that iron example, you can see it's iron three, right? Let me look here with my eyes. Yep. Iron three. <laughs> so you know that there are three valence electrons for that iron atom. So work through again whichever method you like and write down your chemical formula. And you're going to start noticing your pattern. Okay. So again, this is just kind of trying to find different things for yourself to help reinforce what we've been learning in class. And it says you should see an interesting pattern where writing the ionic charge before writing the chemical formula. And you'll see there the ionic charges on the left, the formulas on the right, what pattern do you notice? All right, so this is a pattern that we've already learned about that I've already mentioned previously, but here you can start to really see it for yourself and read through all this text here. So make sure that you simplify numbers if they have a common factor. So in our first row, for example, calcium oxide, they both have two, so we simplify it down to one, right? It's gonna be more of a ratio. And then we get to number 10. So just more questions to answer with your periodic table. How many valence electrons do neon, argon, and krypton have? What column are they in? What is the ionic charge when an element of that column forms an ion? What is the name for the elements in that column? So there's a name for what we call that column. I've mentioned a couple times. Take a look, see if you can figure out what it is. Number 11. How many valence electrons do lithium, sodium, and potassium have? What column are they in? What will be their ionic charge? And what's the name for those elements? And if you don't know the names, you can actually research this online, right? I have no problem if you guys use your textbook, your notes, or even Google to look up some answers. Just make sure that you're using good sources to find your research, academic sources. And number 12, you're just going to keep answering questions. So this is about beryllium, magnesium, and calcium. Then you're going to jump down to number 13, which asks about fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. And hopefully you'll start to see a little bit of a pattern there. Now once you answer those questions, you'll see another printout in case you don't have or you want more of your different cutouts. Okay. But if you don't need them, they're just there in case. Don't worry about that. And then scrolling on down, you see your diagram of that nucleus and the electron energy levels or your Bohr model. Okay. All right. That's it. That's your lab. So again, this is your ionic lab, periodic table and ionic bonding lab. Make sure you read through the procedure, and hopefully watching this video will help you get started and will help you know what to expect as you go. You have a lot of questions to answer, but then this should be a really great study aid as you get closer to the exam, okay? All right, keep an eye out for the video for your next covalent bonding lab, and otherwise email me and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.